So, hello, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be in Prague, one of my favorite cities uh, in the world, actually. I was here a couple of years ago, and this time I'm getting to stay a couple of extra days and explore, so I'm really excited about that. But I want to jump straight into my talk because I have a lot to cover. This talk is talk, uh, it's really like formed around GraphQL, but in reality, what I'm going to be showing is a combination of GraphQL and front-end technologies. So kind of mainly what I'm using is React, but the ideas can apply to any platform. Um, there's three main ideas I want to drive home. One of those is around API uh, gateway and GraphQL is, as an API gateway. So essentially, instead of thinking of GraphQL as a way to just interact with your data sources, instead thinking of GraphQL as a way to interact with any service or any microservice or any function, anything that's outside of the core of your application. Um, also, developer velocity. A lot of the things I'm going to show today are kind of focused really on rapid development, rapid iteration, prototyping, experimenting, and essentially just developer velocity and developer um, experience. And then finally, the future of GraphQL. The things that I'm going to be showing today, I think, are really where we're headed in this community. And if you really uh, have watched and seen some of the um, blog posts and talks that I've done, I'm really interested in the future. I'm really interested in futurism and where things are going and trying to ride the wave and kind of be where the next thing is as it's cresting. And that way we can benefit from um, you know, that experience. So welcome to my talk. This is Curious Cases of GraphQL. My name is Natter Dabit. You can follow me on Twitter, GitHub, Medium, and Dev.2 at Dabit3. I'll follow you back. I'm a web and mobile developer, an author, and a podcaster. My two books are React Native in Action and Full Stack Serverless. Full Stack Serverless from O'Reilly Publications goes along with a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about today. And this is the a layout of my talk. So we have an introduction to modern AWS tech. I'm going to build an API in five minutes, an API that includes authentication, authorization, database, um, data connections, um, relationships between the data, and we're going to test it out all within five minutes. And then demo overload. I have a lot of demos to show, so we're going to jump right in there. I work for AWS on the client technologies team. The two technologies I work most closely with are AWS Amplify and AWS AppSync. AWS AppSync is a managed GraphQL service. So you could think of this essentially as something like Firebase, but for GraphQL. And we have a lot of different features kind of built into it. One of the main ones that people really enjoy is that we have enterprise security and authorization baked in, something we've really thought about uh, a long term. Um, and then there's Amplify. Amplify is a couple of things. It's a command line interface. It's a client library that allows you to interact with services that you've created from the command line. A toolkit that allows you to do things like GraphQL code generation. And we have framework-specific components for React, Vue, React Native, Angular, and Ionic. And what I'm going to demo today for this API that we're going to build in five minutes is the GraphQL transform library, which is an SDL over your GraphQL schema that allows you to add de decorators or directives to your schema and build out a more complex application than writing all this manually. A lot of the applications that we write today fall into the lines of CRUD list, uh, list applications. So if you have a to-do app, you might have a base to-do type, but you need a way to create, read, update, delete, and list these to-dos. You also might need some type of data source to go along with this base type. And you need a way to connect the operations to the data source, so you need GraphQL resolvers. We have directives that can do things like generate all this for you. At model will generate the database, all of the different resolvers, and the schema for you from a base type. Auth will let you configure authorization roles directly on your schema. Connection allows you to model relationships. Those are the three that I'm going to cover today. So the challenge that I have for myself is I want to build a conference API for Reactive Comp in five minutes. That means we need a schema, resolvers, a database, authorization rules, and we want to model relationships between the data. We want to actually test this out also locally. So we'll get started. Here I'm starting off with an Amplify project. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and add the API. Can everyone see that? Pretty good. So to add an API, you can run Amplify Add and then uh, API. And we can choose between GraphQL and REST. I'll give the API a name, or I'll just take the default. 
I can choose the authorization type for the API. So if you'd like to bring auth0, you can choose something like OpenID Connect. If you want to use a managed authorization service or authentication service, Amazon Cognito User Pools is what I'm going to go with, because that's a managed service that we work with. Um, we can then configure some advanced settings, which I'm not going to do. Now, if we have a GraphQL schema that we can reference, I can go ahead and choose that here. But since I don't, I'm going to go ahead and ask for a guided schema creation, which will essentially just give us three boilerplates that we can work with. And the, bo the boilerplates that we can start with are a single object with fields, one to many relationships, or a schema that has authorization rules kind of baked in for us to, to reference. But um, um, it doesn't really matter because we're going to be starting from scratch. So I'm going to go ahead and choose yes, and we're going to go ahead and edit this schema. And what we get started off with is a basic type of to-do. And we don't really want this. We want a conference app. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this, and we're going to go ahead and start over from scratch. So we want a talk type. We want the talk to have an ID, a talk name, and a talk summary, speaker bio, et cetera. And then we want to have a way to have people comment on the talk. So we want to be able to have communication while the talk is going on. People can ask questions with each other. And then maybe when the talk is over, the speaker can then you know, go back and look at the comments and maybe uh, respond. Now we need to model a relationship. So what I'm going to do here is add a comments field to the talk. And you'll notice that we have these two directives now on talk. At model, we'll scaffold out all of the resolver, all of the uh, resolver code, all of the different uh, other operations. We can then modify those with our own business logic if we'd like to. At connection will allow us to define a relationship between two types. So I need to define a relationship between the talk and the comment. So therefore, we have a comments type on the talk, uh, a comments field on the talk, and a, and a talk field on the comment. Finally, we want to be able to add some authorization rules because we don't want everyone to be able to create a talk. We only want admins to be able to create a talk. Therefore, we can now use the at auth directive, which will allow us to go ahead and scaffold out some boilerplate resolvers that will allow only people that are signed as, as an administrator to be able to create, read, or update talks. But anyone will be able to read the talk because we've set query rules to null, so we don't want any rules on queries. Finally, the comment is very similar in the sense that we want to have some authorization rules. But our rules are going to be a little different here. We want to allow anyone to be able to create a comment, but only the owner of the comment to be able to update or delete th this comment. So we're done now. Our schema is ready to go. We can now test this out. So I'm going to go ahead and jump back to the command line. And from here, we can now mock all of this locally. We don't have to deploy anything. All we need to do is run amplify mock. And this will go ahead and mock our entire application for us. What it's going to do is introspect our schema, see that we need two data sources, two databases. It's going to go ahead and create those two tables locally. So we have a talk table and a comments table now created. It's then run, going to run GraphQL code generation, and we're going to be given the GraphQL code locally that we can use to interact. And we're going to run an HTTP uh, endpoint now on our local host. So we can go ahead and click this. And this is our graphical explorer. Thanks, a big, uh, big thanks to Sean Grove of OneGraph for helping us inter integrate uh, this nice UX on the left-hand side. So what we want to do now is we want to go ahead and update our auth. And we want to make sure that the user that signed in is just a regular user, because we want to test that authorization rule. So we're going to add a new mutation for creating a talk. We'll give a speaker bio. And we'll just do some, um, some basic data here. We want to go ahead and create this talk. And we'll notice that we're unauthorized to do this because we're not logged in as an admin. So we can go ahead and update and simulate an admin user by passing in an admin as the group and generating a new token. And now we'll be able to create this mutation. The next thing we want to do is take this talk ID and create a comment on the talk. And the comment that we want to create is going to be basically you know, just someone that's in the audience creating a comment on the talk. So I can go ahead to create comment. I can pass in the ID of the, of the talk. And I can create a message. And then I can go ahead and actually return 
not only the message and the ID, but I can return created by, because we're gonna actually read the user information off of the token and store that in the database. So next I wanna go ahead and sign out and sign in as a audience attendee. And now I'm signed in as someone else, and I wanna go ahead and create this comment on the talk. So we've created our comment on the talk, we've created our talk. Let's go ahead and now query for all of this. So we can now do the list talks query that will return our items. And you'll now notice that there is a relationship between the talks and the comments. So we can drill down and get the comments that relate to this talk and we can return those items as well. So I'll go ahead and return the ID, the message and who created it. So I'll go ahead and run this query. Now we'll see that not only do we get the information about the talks back, we also get the array nested comments. Once we're ready to deploy this, we can go back to our command line and then run amplify push. I'm not gonna worry about that because we don't have time for that, but I just wanted to show that. So next we're gonna go ahead, yes. <laughs> um, thank you. Next we're gonna go ahead and do some demos. So the first demo I wanna talk about is real-time SMS and markdown. These are the curious cases of GraphQL, if you haven't noticed by the name of this. What if you could SMS text message uh, markdown and do something with it? So I created an app for that, and it's especially good for this conference because you can now text message comments about this talk to me, and by the end of the talk, I'll go back and reference these comments if I have time and answer any questions. I'm bypassing the native uh, conference uh, speaker discussion thing, right? Um, so let's go ahead and take a look. So if you want to comment, you can go ahead and text the message to plus one nine one zero two four nine six seven six five, and this is going to go ahead and um, create you know a new message, and we're going to go ahead and view that user interface in just a second. And now let's look at how we built this. Uh, we well, I basically took. Um, the idea of using GraphQL mutations and having a screen that listens for these new messages coming in in real time and displays them on a screen. That's what I wanted to happen, so how could I do that? I used a service that you can uh, create phone numbers with, Amazon Pinpoint. You could also use something like Twilio. Um, once a message comes in, we send the message to a Lambda function. The Lambda function creates a GraphQL mutation. The client listening to that subscription will then get that data. Um, so I defined the data basically like this. I needed an origination number and a message body. The origination number just tells us who sent the message. The message body is the markdown. Second, I created the GraphQL schema. The GraphQL schema only needs an origination number, a message body, and an ID. And then finally, the Lambda function looks something like this. We take the message off of the data and we parse it. We then get the origination number and the message body off of that data, and we create a really raw HTTP request using something like Axios. And here I'm passing in the URL, the API key, and the information that is the actual variables for the message. And let's go ahead and demo this. And I'm curious if anyone else is curious enough to send messages here. So let's go ahead and take a look. And if anyone wants to create a message, I'll go back and check this out. But looks like we have one message um, from someone saying, hello world, that's pretty cool. Um, if you wanna send an image, anything like that, go ahead, check it out. Um, ne next, we're gonna go ahead and do another demo. And I think what I need for this demo, let's go ahead and take a look. Yes, I'm gonna need an audience member as a, uh, you know, someone that volunteers. So who wants to volunteer to come up and, and be part of this presentation? Yeah? Okay, come on. <laughs> so what we're going to do is GraphQL image recognition. We're going to take an image, run it through a GraphQL operation to a machine learning service, get information about that, and return that in the response for the GraphQL. Hey, come on. Hey, I'm Natter. Hey, I am Michael. Thank you, Michael. Let's give Michael like a little bit of round of applause. So um, the, uh, the way that this is gonna work is we're gonna take an image, uh, it's gonna be a picture for us. We're gonna send it and store it in an image service. That's gonna kick off a, uh, a new mutation or actually it's gonna send an operation to a machine learning service with the image information. That will give us the data and that's gonna be returned back in JSON. So that's kind of how that looks. We're gonna skip over the functionality because we wanna jump into this demo. And when I come back, I'll kind of walk through how this all works. So. Come on, let's go ahead and take a picture. You can come right here. What we're gonna do is we can either toggle the camera or we can actually, yeah, there we go. 
All right, so we're taking the picture now. We're going to give this a little bit of time. This is going to upload the image. It's going to then, uh, you know, get the image information, run it through the uh, image recognition service, respond uh, in a Lambda function, GraphQL mutation, and we're going to get that back here. So here's where you want to check out the info. So we have two people. <laughs> yeah, you can go ahead. Thank you. We have two people. Uh, one is estimated at 30. One is estimated at 47. Uh, I'm the 30-year-old. Um, we're both smiling. Um, neither one of us have glasses on. We both have our mouths open. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, and our emotions are angry and disgusted, and disgusted and <laughs> disgusted and confused. So, yeah, I'm not sure what that's all about, but yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the volunteer. Um, so let's look at the function that did that. We basically have two types of images that you can upload, one of a person, one of not a person. If we send a type of labels, that means we're sending something that's not a person. So we want to kind of image, we want to recognize like a general image maybe. We want to say, oh, there's a TV in this image, there's maybe a, a car. Uh, if there's a person, we want to then recognize uh, labels on their faces. So we check to see if the type is labels or not. We set some attributes. We create a new params object with the image information, which is basically the URL of that image. We then call the recognition service, which is a machine learning service. And there are a bunch of them out there. This is AWS, but you don't have to use AWS. There are others out there. We call it detect labels or detect faces. Passing in that data, it returns some JSON. We stringify that, send it back, and then we display that on the screen. So that's kind of how that works. All right, so the next thing we want to go over is real-time music collaboration. How can we build a step sequencer that allows people to collaborate together and create music? So let's see how that's done. Um, first, I needed a base project to start with because I cannot understand how to build this from scratch. I needed somewhere to start with. I then make it cloud-enabled. So what I found was the Traplord 9000. The Trap Lord 9000 was created by Ken Wheeler, and a uh, big shout out to him for creating this. I saw him give a talk in New York. I basically took uh, his project and then made it cloud enabled. And what happens here is that step sequencer, you have an array of different uh, values that represent a slice in the sequence. So as we go from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, if there's a 1, that means the sound gets played. If it's a 0, that means the sound doesn't get played. So all we need to do is just take this data, allow you to mutate it locally, and then send a mutation up to your GraphQL API. Any of the clients listening to this can then take that new data as it comes through in a GraphQL subscription, run an update, and then therefore you have people collaborating. So the way I built this was I created a drum machine type with an ID, a client ID, a beats, and a name. The thing that might stand out here is we have a client ID. The reason we do that is because we don't want to listen to subscriptions, changes that we made ourselves. So if we made the change, we discard the data because we've done an optimistic update. If someone else has made that change, then we refresh our own client application. So the demo for this uh, looks something like this. I have a website that I created for this demo, actually. It's called hypebeats.dev. If you'd like to play along, go for it. I'm going to create a new drum machine called Reactive. And then we're going to go ahead and see if we can work on this together. So we have this Reactive beatbox. I'm going to now open a new beatbox in another window. And what we're going to do is, once this machine loads, we're going to go ahead and set some steps here. And we're going to see that they come through in real time over here. And then I'm going to go here and play the step sequencer. And then over here, I can still make the updates. And they'll start coming through. So let's see if we can create some good beats. I'm not like a DJ or nothing like that. But you know, I'm, I do a little something. OK, now some people have started stepping in. I don't have to do any more work. OK, cool. So uh, yeah, this can get a little rowdy when you have a bunch of people doing it. But yeah, we have some, some beats being made now. And it's all coming through in real time. And I don't have to really do any more work from here. Um, so that's, that's Hype Beats. Um, I have two more demos, so let's see if we can get through these. What about GraphQL infrastructure as code? If you saw the way that we did that schema decoration using that, that GraphQL, uh, those dec directives that create uh, databases, they create schema, they do all this other stuff that GraphQL, you know, you wouldn't think would do. That, this kind of opens the door for many other things, because what if you have a reproducible backend that you would like to create? 
Theoretically, you could take a schema, decorate that schema to be that application back end and share it amongst your peers, open source it, whatever. People could then use that to kind of have a base to start with. Infrastructure as code is something that isn't really that familiar to most front end developers. And it isn't to me either. The cool thing about what we work on, and I think what you're going to see other people doing as well outside of AWS, is as you create your application from the command line, so you saw us earlier run Amplify init, we're actually creating GraphQL and infrastructure as code for you in a folder that's called Amplify. You can then share that Amplify folder and redeploy your application to anywhere for anyone, and you have kind of a re you have a uh, a, per, a reproducible version of your back end that can be shared among other people. So the, the experiment that I had a few months ago was, what if I wanted to create a conference app that people could reuse over and over? I go to a lot of conferences, I talk to a lot of organizers. One thing that they keep on doing is they keep creating apps over and over and over. They cost anywhere between ten dollars to $50,000 to build, but they all do the exact same thing. I felt like this was a pretty good candidate for a reproducible app that we could then take this idea of full stack serverless and kind of put it together. So what I, what I created was conference app in a box. Conference app in a box is uh, open source and we have around uh, 30 conferences that I've personally worked with that have used this. Um, I've worked with three independent consultants that have Average around $1,000 is an hour because they charge their clients like $15,000, $20,000. It only takes them like five to 10 hours to deploy, which is great. Um, that's the whole idea here is being uh, efficient. Um, so around half a million dollars of known value. And this isn't even something I've really tried to push. It's just something I put out there. People have really found it interesting. And it's basically a conference app that you can build and get up and running with and theme in just a couple of seconds. Um, a couple of, uh, not seconds, okay. Let's, let's be real. Probably a couple of hours maybe to get, to get where you want, want, want to be. Um, so to build this, I created a schema with a talk and a comment, the exact same application that we built earlier. And to create this, amplify init, added the API, and then push, deployed the back end. This is the infrastructure as code that you're left with. It's a back end folder that you can then take and update and then you know, deploy again. You can share this with other people, or you can package this up with the front end, and what you are left with is the Docker version or like, you know, of mobile development, you know, or whatever you would call it. I don't really know what to call it. I call it full stack serverless. It's reproducible applications that contain both a front and a back end. So what does this app look like? Well, it looks something like this. Um, this is a app that I put together in my last talk, actually, a few hours ago, took about five minutes. And what we have here is like a couple of talks listed. You can go in and drill down and view talk information. You can then um, create comments on a talk. And I won't demo the comment portion of this, but you can just uh, create a comment. The comments come through in real time and pretty decent user interface. If you'd like to theme it, we have a theme file that you need to change maybe seven variables. And from there, you're ready to go with a um, custom version of this. That's conference app in a box. And then my last demo is something that I released to the public a few hours ago, Jamstack CMS. Jamstack CMS is a full stack content management system built with serverless technologies. It has Gatsby on the front end. It has serverless tech on the back end. If you think about WordPress and the reason that it became so successful and so popular, in my opinion, is that it had everything encompassed into one package and you didn't have to be an expert web developer to get a website up and running. You could just go and deploy this thing. You end up with some pretty sophisticated authentication and authorization rules. You have a database, you have a front end, you have everything kind of built out for you and then you can theme it and you got a lot done in a short amount of time. It's how I got into the web development and I'm sure a lot of other people as well. Um, I think we can do better now. WordPress is still amazing, but we're working with things like uh, server rendered applications. We want to use GraphQL. We want to be able to maybe iterate qu more quickly. So the Jamstack CMS is my you know, take at that. And um, let's take a look at what this looks like in, in practice. So this is kind of like a, uh, a deployment of the Jamstack CMS that I have right here. Um, from here, you can kind of create pages in three different ways. You can create a blog post from the admin panel. You can create a web page from the admin panel, or you can hard code your own uh, components locally, just like you can with any Gatsby site. If you want to take a look and edit 
uh, an existing post. You can just click edit if you're logged in as an admin. Here you're given the WYSIWYG editor. You can publish and unpublish. If you're an admin, you'll also have access to this admin panel where you can publish unpublished existing articles. You can create a new post. Uh, you can view all of the different images that you have available uh, to you that you've uploaded securely. Or you can create a new web page, uh, drag stuff around, and then when you're ready to go, you just save and publish. And then we have the settings area, which is pretty cool because here you can theme it a little bit. Let's say we want to create a reactive theme. We want to create a border. We want to change this up a little bit. Maybe we want to change the title of our site. When we're ready to deploy this, because it's Gatsby, the only people seeing this admin are us. The people that are actually viewing the site are not seeing this. They're seeing the static version of this. So to deploy a new static version, we can just click the deploy button. This kicks off a new build. This is triggering a web webhook to either Netlify or Amplify Console or whatever other hosting service you're using. And then if I go to Amplify Console, give it a couple of seconds, I see now that we have a new build that started running. The new build was triggered by that webhook that I just ran. So that is full stack serverless. That was my demonstration of that. Um, the idea to deploy these apps is you clone them. And if you're using AWS, you run Amplify init, Amplify push, and then you're ready to roll. Um, if you'd like to see the code for all of these applications, github.com slash dabit3 slash curious cases of GraphQL. You can also go to github.com slash jamstack CMS and star jamstack CMS. I would really appreciate that. Um, yeah, thanks for the Unsplash talent creators, Jens Johnson, Kareem Manjara, Christian Spies, and Edwin Andrade. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nader, David, I have three questions for you here, at least. So there is a hype about Resolver. First implementation over Scheme first. What do you think about this? Um, I think that it just depends on the person building the application. I really don't think one is better than the other. I think a lot of people get very opinionated about stuff when and the end goal is that we just want to create things, we want to build things, we want to actually get things done. If you can get things done in a way that is like going against the way that the current person that is really hyping up something that they created themselves maybe is talking about, then I wouldn't listen too much to them. I think that uh, both, ver bo both ways of doing things are good. Um, I don't really see any reason that I would not continue with schema first uh, GraphQL development. What happens if you want to change your data type model? Any kind of migration support? Uh, yes, so you can continually migrate and change your, uh, your schema. And uh, as, you, as you change your schema, you can deploy new versions and revert back to old versions with versioning. That's built in. And last question for today. Can you run both REST and GraphQL at the same time? Yes, absolutely. It's built in. <laughs>